Ah, the joys of being an AFL YouTuber. I was saying to dad in previous years, straight after a really bad loss, the best thing to do would be to put your head in the sand and pretend that football doesn't exist for a week until the next game where you can let the enthusiasm build up and be very selective as to when you switch on and off to football. But unfortunately, the reality is I've got a YouTube channel where I need to front up on a Monday morning and tell everyone my thoughts on football in general. I'd love to just pretend football doesn't exist for a while, distance myself from the pain, but can't do that. I need to lick my wounds and stare reality in the face, and that is the Eagles are just an average football team this year. So obviously making this video in the wake of a really, really disappointing home loss to Essendon on Saturday night to cap things off. It was a really wet day as well, so I got soaked going to and from the game. Not the kind of soaked you want to be at a football game. But yep, the Eagles were simply outlasted by a better Don side on the night and people who might not have watched the game and certainly people came up to me after the game who hadn't seen it thought, you know, what the hell happened to the Eagles in the second half? We were five goals up. How do you blow a lead like that? But the reality is five goals up kind of flattered us, to be honest. We were never a five goal better side than Essendon throughout that game. We'll get into the, some of the numbers in a minute as well, but it just never really felt like we were pantsing this team. And honestly, I, I kind of drew parallels to the St. Kilda loss earlier this year at Marvel, where we led by 32 points. This game, we led by 29. In both games, we were never really cooking them. It was just a case of how long can we keep up this clinical performance in front of goal that will allow us to get a big enough lead to win. First of all, I do want to preface this video by giving full credit to Essendon. They are a good side. Considering the outs and the exodus they had last year, to be putting in this, this sort of competitive season where they now find themselves in the eight, that may change by the end of the round. To be where they are is a massive success. They've got a lot of good young talent and that young engine room with guys like McCra, Merritt and Paris all running through there. They're looking really, really good for the future. So I do respect Essendon as a side. I did nominate this game as an upset of the round prior to the game going ahead. And that wasn't out of, you know, a negativity around the Eagles. It was honestly about respect for Essendon and knowing that the brand of footy that they can bring. In a way, I'm kind of pleased to see Essendon get where they are. You know, putting aside the fact that I go for the Eagles, it was nice to see Essendon claim a scout because they've had some really good form this year. But people hadn't quite given them the respect of being a genuine top eight contender, including myself. So I think this scalp does go some way to sort of announcing themselves as an outside chance. The reason I guess I'm somewhat pleased for them is that uh, I did my predictions at the start of the year and I you know, had some really, really stinker calls in that, but I've also had some half decent ones. I nominated GWS, Essendon and Collingwood to all do better than people expected despite losing players. Collingwood won, I got it horribly wrong. The GWS call's not looking terrible. And with Essendon, I said that they would be, you know, an outside chance for the finals this year, probably have a real purple patch at some point in the year and then die off later in the year. We'll see what happens with the rest of the year, but at the moment, that's looking like a fairly good prediction. So when I see myself kind of vindicated, it makes me feel a little bit better about myself. But anyway, I wanted to give credit to Essendon because I didn't want it to seem like, you know, this is a horrible loss for West Coast because Essendon is shit doesn't really take any gloss off the Essendon team. But equally, the fact that Essendon aren't bad doesn't mean the Eagles don't have serious issues in 2021. The stats do tell the tale. The efficiency inside 50 of this particular game was very one-sided. It was 56% Essendon and 36% West Coast. And you know, the Eagles are a team that struggle with supply. So if we're not getting that efficiency going inside 50, how the hell can we expect to win? Nat Nui was judged by AFL player ratings. Again, take as much you know stock out of that as you choose. But he was rated the most influential player on ground. We won the hitouts 52 to 14 and yet lost overall clearances by one you know and that just goes ahead to show the inside midfield dominance Essendon had guys like Parrish were fantastic he's been fantastic all year and I think they've won five out of six games or six out of seven games where he's had over 30 touches and we really didn't do much to shut him down yes the Eagles lost Tim Kelly early who was our best midfielder at the time um, but it was a weird game where we sort of got better after he left and then really slowed down in the second half so availability hurt there but this has been the tale of our season even though we've had injuries you know the the midfield battle and the clearances and contested possessions it's always been a weakness for us we really couldn't play this game on our terms we're normally a strong marking side i think the stat is if we have over 90 marks we generally win the game almost every time but i think it was like 77 to 99 essendon's way so just clearly couldn't play our marking and lead up sort of style game and someone like Jaden laverty had a great game just dominated darling and we really couldn't get any sort of you know dominance through that area it was a weird game where i don't know how much to read into it but i thought we ran out of legs you know having a player down for the last patch of it with Allen getting concussed wouldn't have helped, but I looked at the stats. We had 11 unused interchanges as well, so I'm not really sure how to explain that one. But yeah, like even though we were five goals up, as I said, it never really felt like we had our foot, you know, on the pedal at any time. I felt Essendon came hard and they played with a great spirit for all four quarters. Really disappointing to lose because, you know, obviously the impact it has on our season. 
for me, I mean, I think we were an outside chance for the four anyway. Still had a glimmer of hope before last night, but that is completely extinguished. So the effect on the short term is, you know, I hate to say it, but yeah, that's, that's us done. I mean, season over is a very meaningless and broad term. It means different things for different clubs. For some clubs, you know, it's season over if you can't win the flag, and that's probably where we are at at the moment. But for other clubs, season over is when you mathematically can't make the finals. I still think we're a half-decent chance for the eight, but in terms of achieving what we wanted this year, it's pretty much season over. It's a year where the Eagles haven't really had momentum, you know, go their way. We've also had a lot of brutal injuries. I will say, though, every other club has had injuries. We've we're probably up there for games lost this year in terms of the, the players that have missed. But it's not an excuse at all for where we're sitting on the ladder. And, you know, I think back to 2018, we had at least comparable injuries to key players at this point of the season. And, you know, we all know what happened in 2018. So it's not a good excuse. But what it has done is, you know, expose what is a really poor level of depth at the Eagles. And, you know, the couple of key injuries to the midfield, which is, you know, our glaring Achilles heel, it hasn't made it easy for us either. For me, I think what's glaringly obvious is confidence is low. I mean, you look at the physicality. We've never been a physical side, never been great in terms of, you know, tackle numbers and contested ball and ground ball hard gets and all that stuff. We've always sucked at it a little bit, but it's really, really clear now. And I think confidence is a big factor in that. When you're not confident, you're not going quite as hard at the ball as you need to be. And, you know, it's really showing out there. But it's not just confidence going for the ball. It's also the way we move the ball. You know, it's just a few moments throughout the game where, you know, instead of, you know, going directly to our forwards, especially in a bit of a wet game where territory is really important, we sort of, you know, shuffle, handball backwards, handball again, and we, we basically take three or four handballs and kicks to achieve what one kick would have done. And yes, it's all well and good. You know, sometimes switching is generally beneficial. The Eagles are a good switching side. But, you know, when you, when you sort of just don't do it with the same urgency you kind of just put yourself under pressure and we've seen that constantly this year it's all well and good when you you know you at a stoppage and you have numbers out the back and you can sort of handle back and they can switch but when the third or fourth bloke just fumbles it every time you just really put yourself on the back foot and it's not we're not playing that eagles brand that has made us a good side in previous years but on top of all that the numbers don't lie and the supply to the forwards is just it's just mind-blowing how little inside 50s we generate for a team that at, to this point is currently in the top eight we had 12 less inside 50s than Essendon on the night, and we kicked really accurately, kicking 11 goals fives. The difference between the two sides was one goal nine. This game could have been a lot worse if we weren't such a strong team in the forward half. You know, Josh Kennedy, even in his age, is still the sort of player you give a set shot to, you know, where the, the boundary line hits the 50 meter mark, and he, he generally is a good chance of kicking it, and that's what he did on Saturday night. But, you know, if he's a little bit off, this game suddenly blows out to a seven goal loss. I also think back to Adelaide a few weeks ago, we had eight less inside 50s and we kicked 16 goals 10. Again, very accurate and five straight kicks was the difference between the two sides. Against Collingwood earlier this year, we had eight less inside 50s, we kicked 16 goals 7, so accurate, but you know, we can't rely on the forward line just being on their A game every week because, you know, we've, we're still kicking accurately now and losing games. Here's a real kicker. Against St Kilda, we had 17 less inside 50s, we kicked 13 goals 4, we lost the game by 20 points. But, you know, that probably should have been a seven or eight goal loss. To only register 36 inside 50s against a team like St. Kilda, that is mind-blowing. This team, I know, is better than those numbers suggest. We flick it on when we want to. We have the personnel, albeit, you know, with some injuries, but we can't expect to win anything meaningful if we're getting battered like that. And again, we talked about the depth. It's not quite there yet, particularly in the midfield. I don't think we've done a good job of recruiting for our midfield in recent years, other than obviously Tim Kelly. But I think the only first round draft that we spent on a midfielder since 2011 or something like that is Dom Sheed. In fact, it was 2010, Gaff was before Sheed. But since then, it's just all been talls or, you know, utilities. I mean, what now can the Eagles realistically achieve for the rest of the year? You have to think top eight is the best possible outcome for us right now. But, you know, I think we need to look a little bit, you know, Different to that, we can't we can't just be aiming to win as many games as we can. This is a good opportunity for the Eagles to sort of test their depth. You know, there's a lot of role players on the list. Admittedly, these guys are getting games. You know, your Joneses, your Witherdens, your Harry Edwards, they're getting a bit of opportunity, but now that needs to be the focus. I'd rather not do what we did in 2017 and just rotate the same sort of mature age, underperforming plays in and out of the team. If we're gonna stumble towards the finals or even miss, I'd rather at least be productive in the way that we give games to the players that are probably going to be part of the next few years. Has been some bright spots this year. You know, Jermaine Jones, I think, is going to be a fairly long-term player for us. He's not a world beater, but he's at least come in and plays a role. Jared Brand has finally found a little niche for him in the team as a bigger-bodied midfielder. Drafts as a key forward, sort of spent time back as well, but never really found his niche. If we can keep giving games to him, that's at least something we can take out of this year. Big fan of Bailey Williams, also a big fan of Harry Edwards. And, you know, looking at the state of the, the sort of medium-term future of this midfield, Xavier O'Neill also needs to play more games. 
I'm definitely not talking about, you know, just dumping all the old players and just playing the kids. I think that would be stupid, but you got to cycle in some of these guys while this mature team is playing a decent level of football. Someone like a Zane True should get a debut this year. Hopefully, he's been fairly consistent in the waffle. Izzy Window, we've seen a little bit of, done his knee at the moment, but again, the sort of player you want to see more of. We do need to find something out of this year. In 2017, like I said, we stumbled towards the finals and what we got out of that year was that amazing final against Port Adelaide. You know, whether or not it's connected or not, but it felt like it kind of springboarded us into 2018. This year, I just have fears that we're going to be another sort of making up the numbers team of the eight at best. So we might as well get something out of it and sort of lower expectations and give opportunity to younger guys. And you know what? This Eagles side does so much better without expectation. In 2015, when nobody really rated us, that's where we came second. 2016 and 2017, we had all the expectation in the world and we fell down the ladder. 2018, some people expected us to win the spoon and we won the flag. Back that up with 2019 and 2020, we failed to make the top four. And again, that's we're seeing the same thing in 2021. We don't particularly thrive as being the hunted team of the comp. So hopefully, maybe this allows us a bit of a reset and we can sort of get that hunger and enthusiasm back. We've talked about the short and the medium term. In terms of the long term, I'm still very relaxed about where this list is, but there's still some very obvious glaring sort of weaknesses that this list has. First of all, don't rebuild. Hate the word rebuild. Don't think it's a good model to go down. We've seen what happens to teams when you, or clubs rather, where you don't get a rebuild right. And I think the Eagles do have too much talent on their list to even think about trying to, you know, throw away that completely. But that doesn't mean you don't hit the draft hard. And that's what we need to do. Same thing in 2017, we did hit the draft hard. We had a bumper draft class. We got Oscar Allen, Jared Brander, Liam Ryan, Petricelli, and a couple of others. Port Adelaide hit the draft hard in 2018. They got Rosie, Dersmo, and Butters. What the Eagles need is a next generation midfielder. We just don't really have anyone past, you know, Sheed 26 that we can really rely on. I like the look of O'Neill, but we're going to need to add at least a first round level quality midfielder to this list soon. In terms of immediate retirements, I think JK might go this year, but it sounds like Hearn's going to sign on. So, you know, unless Shuey pulls the plug because he does another hammy, and I, I really hope he doesn't, and I don't think he will, you know, we're not really expecting to lose any players over the next 12 to 24 months anyway. What we do need is a replacement for Shuey and Redden, who are 31 each, I think next year or this year even. That's got to be the focus. The Eagles just need to have a year where they cut the dead wood aggressively this year, draft in some fresh talent like we did in 2017, and hopefully by refreshing the 22, we can get a different dynamic in there. And the other thing I'll say is that's probably hard to appreciate for non-West Coast fans. I wouldn't underrate the impact of young Willy Rioli coming back into the side. Yes, he's missed two years of football, but he's probably one of the most naturally talented footballers I've ever seen, let alone on this list. He's also only 26, an important part of our future. And I think other than, you know, his natural talent, I think his aggressive ball movement and his prodigious ability to hit really difficult kicks, much like Lewis Jetta, really, that really is the Eagles brand. And if we can get him back into the side, I reckon that could breathe a lot of confidence back into this team. I'm not talking about, you know, for finals this year. I'm just talking about longer term over the next three or four years. But look, to sum up the video, Yes, the season is over in terms of achieving what we wanted to achieve this year. We're going to have to shuffle the focus and try and refresh and try and go again over the next couple of years. We need to find the confidence and belief, and we need to also keep turning over the list to make sure that we're in a good position to push. It's a weirdly, strangely tough thing to be a West Coast fan at the moment, and that's going to sound silly to fans who go for you know a less successful club, but the reality is the Eagles won the flag in 2018, and now West Coast fans everywhere, we don't make top four. It's a failed season. You know, I find myself, and this has happened multiple times, including on Saturday night, I said to Dad, not really even excited to go to this home game against a team we're expected to beat because if you win, you know, you just sort of brush it off as a game you should have won, and if you lose, you know, it feels like the, the sky's falling. Personally, I'm just going to try and relax about this year. Hope to God that we find some positives in the way of, you know, developing that talent, find that confidence and belief back, and hopefully with less pressure, it's going to be enjoyable seeing the Eagles play again. Anyway, guys, that's my thoughts on the West Coast Eagles. Let me know in the comments what you think about where they are. Do you think I'm being silly in writing them off for this year? I really don't think I'm being silly. I think that's well and truly been the case. I guess if you're watching this as well, let us know how far you think Essendon can go this year. Does this win sort of signify them as being a genuine contender for the eight? Or do they just catch the Eagles on a bad day? I'm inclined to think it's closer to the former one, but with Essendon, you know, their weakness over the last several years, probably even decade, has been running out of full season. So we'll see what happens there. Hopefully the Eagles bounce back next week and play a reasonable brand of footy against Carlton in Sydney, but being in Sydney, not confident about it at all. But anyway, thanks for watching. Like the video if you enjoyed it, and I'll see you in the next one. Thanks, guys.